There. I heard a baby. Oh, there she is. Look at her walking. <coughs> good morning. It is good to be with you. I think I'm all there. Wonderful to be with you and thankful for the anointing our Lord gave the earth, but uh, glad he also stopped that we might have the opportunity to assemble and worship again together. If that's too hot, you let me know. The scripture reading, as David said, is 1 Chronicles chapter 15. I'm not there, and I'm not going to be reading from it. We're going to read from it at the appropriate time because it is integral to our lesson. If you want to have your ribbon on 1 Chronicles 15, our first reading will actually come from 1 Chronicles 13. The Bible, brethren, is filled with admonitions to seek God, that he might save us, and that we might be able to spend eternity with him in heaven. Isaiah 55 and verse 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. Amos 5 and 4, seek me and live, says the Lord. Even our Lord Jesus in Matthew 11, 28 through 30 said, Come to me. I will give you rest. You have to come to me, though. So the Bible is this repetition of seek the Lord. Come to him. Be saved. But mankind's problem from the beginning is we want to come to God. We want to be saved according to what we want on our terms instead of according to the revealed will of God. From the very beginning in the garden, that has been our problem. So this morning, because this problem is not relegated to those of the past, it is not even relegated to those in the denominational world, it can find itself and rear its ugly head even here among the Lord's people in the kingdom. Because of that, we're going to look at three examples of this terrible problem of seeking God, but on our own terms, and seeking salvation, but only according to our own will. We're going to talk about David and the ark. We're going to talk about Israel and their Messiah. And then we're going to talk about the church and what's been going on inside the kingdom. To begin, David and the Ark. Hopefully you know the story. I'm going to give you a brief overview. David was the man, a man after God's own heart, who God chose to be the shepherd of his people. Notice the qualifications the Bible tells us about David. He was a man after God's own heart. Not a man after his own heart. That was how he was contrasted with Saul, King Saul. Because King Saul loved him some King Saul, didn't he? In contrast, David was a man who sought to do the will of God. When you're reading the history of David, you can't help but hear, he's constantly asking the priests, what does God want me to do? Shall I go up and fight against this town? Shall I go and follow my enemy? Shall I go up? What shall I do? Constantly going to God. Because he was a man after God's own heart. And so he was given that privilege to serve as the shepherd of God's people. And when God had finally revealed that it was Jerusalem, that's the city where God would place his name, David sought to bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. Now the Ark had, had quite a journey, hadn't it? It had been created and then it had been carried out of Mount Sinai, and for 40 years, they did circles with it, right, in the wilderness, because of their unfaithfulness, and then finally the ark was carried into the promised land, and it resided at Shiloh for many, many years, until the sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, decided to take the ark of the covenant into battle against the Philistines. 
not because God had said to do it, but because Phineas and Hophni sought to force God to fight for them. Because they reasoned, if we go into battle with the Ark of the Covenant with us, surely God has to uh, defend his Ark. Well, that didn't happen, did it? No. The Philistines won the battle and took the Ark of the Covenant. And they took it back to their city of Ashdod. And there, you may recall, they put it inside their temple. The only problem was when they woke up the next morning, the big statue of their god Dagon was on his face in front of the ark. So they said, it just must have fallen. So they put it back up. The next morning they go in there, it's fallen down again, and its head been removed, and its hands have been removed. Then they started having these issues of people breaking out with tumors everywhere. And then they realized this is a problem because we have this ark. So, being good fellow citizens, they said, I know what we'll do. Let's send it to our brethren in Gath. So they sent it to another Philistine city. And they had tumors and panic. And they, being good neighbors, said, hey, let's send it to our brethren over in Ekron. And they had the same thing. So finally, the Philistines decided, we got to get this ark out of our possession. Let's send it back to Israel. And they did on a cart, and it went to a city called Beth Shemesh. And there, the ark killed many, many inhabitants of Beth Shemesh. Why? Because they tried to look inside the ark, which is forbidden. So they said, being good neighbors, <laughs> let's send this to some other city in Israel. And so eventually it found its way to Kirjath Jirah. And there it resided 20 years until David received that sign. Here is where God's name will be placed. So David, a man of God, man after God's own heart, sought to bring the ark from Kirjath Jirah to Jerusalem. And what happened? Look at 1 Chronicles chapter 13. David has, a, David has a large procession. Verse 7, So they carried the ark of God on a new cart from the house of Abinadab, and Uzzah, an Ohio, drove the cart. Then David and all Israel played music before God with all their might, with singing, on harps, on stringed instruments, on tambourines, on cymbals, and with trumpets. And when they came to Kedon's threshing floor, Uzzah, put out his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and he struck him, because he put his hand to the ark, and he died there before God. David was afraid of God that day, saying, How can I bring the ark of God to me? So David would not move the ark with him into the city of David, but took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house three months. And the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. Brethren, was there any animosity here? Was there any blasphemy against God intended? No, we, we know the story that, and we can all put ourselves in the situation of being Uzzah and walking next to the cart and one of the oxen stumbles, and you see the Ark of the Covenant sliding off the cart. Can you imagine if it would have fallen and broken? It, it would have been unthinkable. So he put his hand out to stop it. Why? Presumptuously? No. With a good heart. And what was the result? He was struck down by God and killed. Why? Because God had said very clearly in the law of Moses, Anyone touches my ark and they will die. Period. It says David was afraid of God and he didn't know what to do. How can I bring the ark if when I try to do it, God kills? Brethren, here's the example of what we had. We had a godly man trying to do a godly thing, but in an ungodly manner because the law had prescription on how the ark was to be moved. Turn over to 1 Chronicles 15, beginning in verse 11. 
And David called for Zadok and Abiathar, the priests, and for the Levites, and for Uriel, and Asiah, and Joel, and Shemaiah, and Eliel, and Aminadab. He said to them, You are the heads of the fathers' houses of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, you and your brethren, that you may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel to the place I have prepared for it. For because you did not do it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not consult him about the proper order. The NASB says, because we didn't do it according to the ordinance. That's where the title of our lesson comes. Notice what happens. Verse 14. So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. And the children of the Levites bore the ark of God on their shoulders by its poles, mark it, as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. Somewhere in that three-month period, someone came to David, looked in the book and said, oops, I know what the problem was. The problem was they had decided to move it in a way they thought would honor God, but not according to what he had said. He had commanded it is to be carried on poles on the shoulders of Levites. Remember, it had the rings at the corners so that the rod could go through it because otherwise someone might be tempted to touch the ark. What are you talking about? It. This is a brand new cart. These are uh, oxen who have never pulled a cart. Exactly. And look what happened. A stumble. A good heart reaches a hand out. And every time, brethren, every time godly people try to do godly things, not according to God's will, the result is always the same. Death and separation. Failure. Every time. Finally, they did it God's way, and all was well. It's a simple lesson that we all have heard, but it is so powerful because, again, there was no animosity. Compare this to what we read about Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, as they sought to worship God. When you think about all the things that they went through to consecrate themselves, to get ready to burn the incense before the, the Lord, and all they did wrong was how they kindled the incense with fire. Instead of using the fire from the bronze laver, not the bronze laver, from the burnt offering laver out in front, they just made it some other way. Well, all you're supposed to do is burn incense, brethren, to the Lord. What does it matter? Do you remember what happened to Nadab and Abihu? They were killed. Fire from heaven came down and consumed them right in front of their daddy. And their daddy was told, don't you weep, don't you mourn. And Moses suddenly understands, this is what God meant when he said, I will be consecrated, I will be honored by my people. What's the big deal? Well, as it was often said, the strange fire of Nadab and Abihu was consecrated by heavenly fire. It matters. Man cannot think that it doesn't because every time a godly deed is tried in an ungodly manner, in a manner not prescribed by God, the result is failure and death every time. Let's consider another example, Israel and their Messiah. If you want to turn to Romans chapter 10. Israel has been waiting 1,400 years for the Christ, their Messiah, the Anointed One. You could even say it was longer than that, more like 1,900 years, because the promise had been given to Abraham, who Israel was from, that through him would come that seed. They've been waiting all this time, and here comes the Messiah, healing the sick, raising the dead, doing all manners of things that even the religious leaders had to admit proved he was the Christ. There. Now I feel like a news reporter or something. Um, they've been waiting for him for 1,400 years at least, and here he comes. Even Nicodemus, 
one of the Sanhedrin, came to Jesus and said, we know you are from God because of the things that you do. And yet, what do we read? We read that the overwhelming majority of Israelites did not become Christian. They did not accept and heed their Christ. Why? Well, turn to Romans chapter 10. Some will say, maybe you're thinking in your mind, well, it's because of the Gentile thing. They couldn't handle the idea of the Gentiles being brought into the kingdom. Look at verse 18. But I say, have they not heard? His point being, this may be an excuse why Israel didn't come to the Lord, but didn't they know that Gentiles were going to be a part? Yes, indeed, their sound has gone out to all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. But I say, did Israel not know? Well, first Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long, I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. So what was the problem? If Israel knew, and here came the Messiah, because they also knew a new law was coming, right? Jeremiah 31, in those days, I'm going to make a new covenant with Israel, not like the old covenant. So they knew all these things. Then what was the problem? Verse 16 is the problem. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our reports? The problem is Israel refused the Messiah they were given. Israel received, refused the new covenant that was coming by way of the Christ. They did not have it. They would not have it. And Paul even tells us the ultimate root of that rejection of the Christ, the first four verses. He says, Israel loves God. They have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They, seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. And then in verse 4, he explains what he's talking about. For the Christ is the end of the law of Moses for righteousness. But they would not have it. And why? Because they wanted their own righteousness. They wanted to be saved their own way. They didn't want to have to be saved in a way where they were with Gentiles. They didn't want to be saved in a way that had to put the law of Moses behind them and now walk in Christian life. They would not have it. What's the result every time? They love God. They knew God. But they would not do things his way. Every time. Well, we find ourselves today in the Christian system. And what do we see in the Christian world? Sadly, we see the proof of what King Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 9. Truly, there is nothing new under the sun. Don't you wish you could say, oh, the foolishness of trying to do God things, not God's way. Surely that's a thing of the past. And you would say, no, it's not. And, and don't call me Shirley. No, things have never changed. There's nothing new under the sun. We're still trying it. In my research for this sermon, I want you to wrap your mind around this concept. It is reported that there are 33,000 denominations calling themselves Christians in the world. 33,000. What explains all of that diversity? What explains all those different ideas on how a person can be saved? What explains all those differences on how the church, the kingdom that is Christ, is to organize itself? What explains all the different ways people choose to worship God? What explains this? We can't even agree on the way a person should live their life. One generation to the next can't agree. Is God the author of all this confusion? 
Well, if you know your Bible, 1 Corinthians 14, 33, you know, no, God is not the author of confusion. So where does this come from? 33,000. And those, you understand, are only the denominations that have names and buildings. We're not even talking about every single individual that says, well, the woods is my church. I'm a Christian, but the, the woods is my church. I go out and I kill Bambi and, you know, I'm very religious. What explains it? If it's not God, it's because if we want to be saved according to our own will, well, how many wills do we have in the world now? I haven't looked recently. How much over 7 billion are we now? We could have that many. And obviously, think about this, brethren, obviously we do because there's only one God and there's only one Lord. So every single human being on this planet is beholden to him and ought to be listening to his word once revealed for all. Did God, was God not clear in how to be a Christian? Was God not clear on how to be one of his people? From the very beginning, church, he has been very clear. Explain to me what's not clear about Genesis 2, 15 through 17. On the day you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. I wonder what in the world he meant by that. It's so perplexing. No. What was the problem then? Well, Satan tempted the man and woman and said that uh, you want to be with God? I got a better deal for you. You can be just like God. All you got to do is eat that fruit. He said, don't eat that fruit. He said, we die if we eat that fruit. No, no, that's not true. He just doesn't want to, you to be like him and you won't die. Crunch. How's that worked out? It was very plain. And what do we see next? What's the next thing we see from Adam and Eve? They're hiding naked in the woods, afraid of God, right? The result every time. What was not clear in Deuteronomy 30 with the last charge of Moses to Israel before they go in to take possession of the promised land? He said, look here, I've put it before you. It's right here in my law. Life and death, blessings and cursings. Choose, which do you want? And we know our history of Israel. Brethren, what did they want? In general, they wanted cursings and death. Why? Because they wanted salvation. They wanted a kingdom. They even wanted a king to start off with, like the nations round about, according to their own will on their own terms. Remember last week we talked about how in Micah 6, 6 through 8, 6 and 7, the people of Israel are saying, okay, God, what's it going to cost for you to bless us? What do you want? How much? They had completely forgotten that the whole concept of sacrifice and worship was so that they could overcome their sin, be forgiven of their sin, and stop sinning. Instead, they saw it as what? It was their power over God. I worshiped you, I killed a goat, give me stuff. Why? That's religion their way. Every time. And here we are in Christianity. Brethren, what's so hard about Romans 10, 17? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. You don't need to study this book. It's just an old Bronze Age book. You don't need to study it. You don't need to know it. You just got to love yourself some Jesus. Well, how do you know who Jesus is? Don't worry about that. Just love yourself some Jesus. But it says right there, you got to hear in order to believe. And in John 8, 24, Jesus himself said, if you don't believe that I am the Christ, you're going to die in your sin. Okay, what's so hard about that? He said, you got to repent, Luke 13, 3. And then in case we didn't get it, he said it again two verses later. No, I tell you, but unless you likewise repent, you will perish. What's so hard about that? You got to change your mind about who's God. Because in your sin, you think you are. And you're not. We have to confess in order to be saved. Romans 10 and 10, what does it say? Confession is made unto salvation. 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10, it says, Repentance produces, 
no, uh, sorrow produces godly repentance, leading to salvation. What's so hard about that? And then finally, you've got to obey and walk humbly with your God. Whatever he says to do. He's told us to be baptized for the remission of sin, a likeness of the uh, death, burial, and resurrection of his son. But he could have told us anything, you understand. It could have been this, right? And we'd all be doing this, saying, I feel silly, but God said. And if God said, that's what we would do. What's so hard about he who believes and is baptized shall be saved? What's so hard about repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit for the remission of sin? What's so hard about 1 Peter 3.21, baptism, which now saves us? And do you understand, church, how few people who call themselves Christians believe that? Practice that? Why? Because we would be saved on our terms. And thank goodness that's all them, right? Thank goodness everybody that calls themselves a Christian in the Church of Christ is rock-ribbed. No, we can do the same thing. How? Well, God has said to live a certain way. And in general, 99.999%, amen. But that point zero, I forgot how many nines I put on it, but the, the point zero zero, whatever the one was, No, I I like that. I want that. I don't really see what's wrong with that. I know the Bible says, but I... There it is, brethren. It's the same thing. Yeah, I want to be saved, but wait a minute. I want to be saved how I want to be saved. I know it says this is a sin, but, you know, what's wrong with love? I guess it comes to how you defend love or define love. If the ultimate result of love is an eternity in hellfire, I wouldn't call that love, would you? No. We can do the very same thing. The question, and it's all about this question, church. From the beginning it was, will you be God's or not? And that's interesting the way I said it, hearing it. Will you be God's plural, thinking you yourself are God, Or will you be God's possessive, be his? Because in Micah chapter 6, after Israel saying, what do you want, what do you want? God told them through the prophet, I've always told you what I want. I want you to do justly. I want you to love mercy. And here it is, brethren. I want you to walk humbly with me. That means he's God. And we do as he says. Everything that he has commanded, we do. Why? Why? Because we love him. Anybody here have parents? Yeah, me too. Um, If you love your parents, you do what they ask you to do. Not only for fear, (laughs) fear fear's sake, that's when you're a child, kind of like Israel, right, in the Old Testament. But when you've grown up, kind of like Christianity, now we do it because love. Perfect love casts out fear. We obey our God because we have the opportunity to be close with our God. We obey our God because he's given us an opportunity to be free from our sin and to spend eternity with him in heaven. And I want some of that. Do you? Then we must walk humbly with him. And here's the question. Don't answer it now. Every minute of your life you're answering this question. What will you do with Jesus? God has given him as the propitiation for your sins. What will you do with Jesus? Some will sneeze. Some will accept that word and move on. But brethren, I tell you, and this is true, when you stand before God in that judgment, there's only going to be one question. What did you do with my son? Did you take him as your Lord and then as your Savior and follow him to everlasting life? If you can answer, yes, hallelujah, brethren. If not, if you cannot answer that you humbly followed him and his will, then unfortunately you will beat the path 
that large and crowded path to destruction. And God is so good, he lets us choose. Brethren, what will you do with Jesus? Here's my advice. Let Jesus be Lord and Savior. Why? Because he is. In Philippians 2, beginning in verse 5, we read that Jesus emptied himself. And we're supposed to be like him. We need to empty ourselves. And he served God, humbling himself even to the death of the cross. And what was the result, church? He was exalted. So that at his name, every knee will bow. We can be just like him. Follow him. Bowing to him. Because all will bow before him at the end. The question is, will you do it willingly? Or will you do it unwillingly? You will bow. And it's the same question. What did you do with Jesus? Did you take him to yourself? Hallelujah. Did you not? Did you try to use him? Did you try to make him conform to your will and your thoughts and your ideas? Whoa. Not W-O-W, but W-O-E. Whoa is you. The greatest thing about Christianity in my mind is that every second of every day we get to completely change our answer. Because, I don't know if you're like me, but I stumble a lot. And I don't do what I want to do perfectly, like we studied in Romans 7. That which I will to do, I do not. That which I will not to do, that I practice. I don't want to do that anymore. Every second of every day, God has given us the opportunity to make the change. So that as long as we die in that pursuit, hallelujah, church, salvation is ours. If you're not a Christian, then you're in your sin. God and sin cannot be together. But God has provided a means for you to be free from your sin. Why not take him up on his offer according to his will? If you don't understand it, talk to one of the shepherds. Talk to me. Talk to some other member in the church and have it explained. Don't leave this morning without knowing how to be saved and have eternity with God. And if you do know, why not today? Christians, it is so easy to bargain with God. I've got bad news. He brooks no bargaining. His will is his will, and all your wishes, you know, right? If wishes were fishes, we'd all cast nets, but his word does not change, but we can. If you've turned away from God, there's that beauty. Turn back and be just as if I'd never sinned. If there's anything we can do to help you in this, we'd ask that you come as together we stand and sing. sure where this one is, David. Oh, there it is. And I'll turn your microphone back.